Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our 14th lecture. Today, after we have learned the structure of the sun, we will learn how the sun works. In a previous lecture, I've shown you that the sun's structure starts with a photosphere, goes into a convection zone, then into a radiation zone, and to the core. And today we'll find out what's going on in that mysterious core that enables the sun to shine for billions of years at a power that's 400 trillion trillion times that of a single light bulb. So we are now going deep into the sun. Looking in the structure of the sun, let's see what makes it tick. Now one thing that I didn't elaborate on is the fact that in the rainbow of lines, the absorption spectrum, the same rainbow line that we use to find the temperature at the surface of the sun, that can be used to find the abundance of elements in the sun. Ends up that 92 out of every 100 atoms is made of hydrogen. Yep, the first element in the periodic table. That chemistry periodic table? Yep, the one on the left upper corner. Of the rest, 7.8% is helium. That's the second element in the periodic table. Okay, do that math together. That means that only 0.2% is left. Alright? Two parts in a thousand are not hydrogen or helium. So something is going on with those hydrogen and helium. Now to the details. Please take a calculator, seriously, a piece of paper and a pencil. One thing that was in front of your eyes for a long, long time may surprise you. Look at the periodic table under the word hydrogen. There is a number there. It says 1.00794. Look under the word helium. It says 4.003. Now take your calculator. Take that hydrogen mass and multiply it by 4. What do you get? If you did it right, you should get 4.03176. Do that number, sorry, put that number right next to the one under helium. Which one is bigger? Yep, the four hydrogens are more massive than one helium. And you're going, yeah, big deal. Yes, it is. First of all, it's bigger than you think because if you notice it's 4.03 versus 4.003 so it's in the uh, decimals right there but it's not just that that difference means that if somehow we put four hydrogens together and we got helium miraculously in the process, we automatically lose some of that mass. Yeah, okay, so now what happened to that mass that disappeared? Yep, it must have turned into energy according to Einstein's rule that E equals mc squared, or energy is the mass, in this case the difference in masses, times the speed of light squared. Big deal, you may say. Well, it is. This 0.07% of the mass turning into energy is enough because the sun is so super massive. The sun is 210 to the 30 kilograms which is basically 2 million trillion trillions kilograms or 4 million trillion trillion pounds. Take just a fraction of that, 7 parts in a thousand, 
and you have enough energy to run the sun for 10 billion years. So how much is that 0.7% really? If we even take the inner 10% of the sun, so we take one tenth of this 210 to the 30, and then we take seven parts in thousand of that, we'll have enough energy. Here's how. You take that mass, multiply it by the speed of light square, which is 310 to the 8 square, or 300 million squared, and you get 1.25 10 to the 44 joule. Joule is similar to a calorie. One calorie gets water temperature up by one degree Celsius. You may recall that from high school. So a joule is kind of close to a calorie, right? Four joules are a calorie, but that's close enough. Anyways, divide that by 310 to the 11 seconds, which is 10 billion years. Guess what you get? You get the exact power of the sun. Tom, 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 tom. The next few slides were made by myself and a few family members, hence the tune. We're trying to answer the question of how did that miracle happen for hydrogens turning into helium? Well, first of all, we had to bring all those atoms together. The way we do that is using gravity. Everybody's attractive, remember? Newton's universal law of gravitation says that every two masses pull on one another. And heck, we have like 210 to the 30 kilograms, so they definitely pull on one another. The only thing that doesn't let them collapse onto one another is the fact that in the middle of the sun it's so hot that the pressure keeps against gravity. Pressure against gravity is called, with a fancy name, called hydrostatic equilibrium. All it means is that there is enough pressure to hold against gravity. That pressure in the middle of the sun is huge. That very huge pressure and very large temperature give rise process of e equals mc square. Let's go on. Now the second force is slightly detrimental to the actual process of putting hydrogens together into helium. It's the electromagnetism force which includes this part about opposites attract. If there was a plus in a nucleus and another minus, heck, that would be nice. But there isn't. There are only pluses in the nucleus of every atom. Those pluses are called protons. So if we took two protons, put them very close together, somehow, they wouldn't want to stay there. Because likes repel. Yeah, opposites attract. But likes repel. Hence, there has to be something else. And that would be in the next slide over. Now, the third force that's basic in nature is called the strong force. It also goes by the strong nuclear force or the chromodynamical force named after a fairly new theory that explains how it works. Or, and that's my favorite, the Velcro force. Because, like a Velcro, it only acts to attract in very, very short ranges. Therefore, if your protons that you were trying to put together in the previous slide hated each other because likes repel, that didn't matter anymore when you got them very close together. If they're very close together, the Velcro holds. The next force is a little different. It's called the weak nuclear force, or the weak force for short. Now, if you can think about it, opposites attract is the electromagnetic force. Likes attract, like in the case of the strong force, and it's only true for protons, not true for electrons. That's got some analogies in your life as well, maybe, at some point. But this next force, the, the, the 
weak force is really weird because it takes a proton and changes it into a neutron yeah one type into another it takes a proton that kind of hates other protons turn it into a neutral it doesn't like doesn't dislike others then it also results in an anti-electron which means an electron that instead of being negative is positive that one's been produced and also a particle called neutrino that only produces in this type of weak interaction well that's kind of bizarre but without those four forces nature itself in atoms wouldn't work so here is how the actual process happens there are two steps in making four hydrogens into a helium in the first one the nuclei of hydrogen meaning the protons get really close together and they stick together because of that strong force so despite their dislike you get them close enough together which happens at huge pressures and huge temperatures in the center of the sun you get them close together they stick together you do but nothing happens as a result because one in every hundred thousand trillion collisions like that that end up in the pluses sticking together end up in them separating but every now and again every once in a blue moon a proton turns into a neutron in that case suddenly they stay stuck together now if that happens almost immediately meaning it doesn't take uh, 10 trillions or so collisions almost immediately this proton neutron pair smashes into another proton neutron pair creating two helium 3 that almost immediately create helium 4 this chain of events leads to the production of a helium and as you can see this is a chain reaction in a sense because there's also a couple of um, free protons going for the next time over in another collision all right end of the day we started with four protons from those pro pro protons we got a helium nucleus and lots of e equals mc square now remember those neutrinos this very rare event when a proton becomes a neutron plus anti-electron and a neutrino these are really important usually stuff happening at the core of the sun the information about that doesn't live for a million years yeah the sun, ke sun keeps on shining but what happened in the sun stays in the sun it's worse than las vegas in that case what does emerge from the middle of the sun is those neutrinos because those particles barely interact therefore in order to capture them you have to find them on earth each second trillions on trillions of those neutrinos go through you without you noticing but every now and again one of those will actually hit a particle in your body and will create some sort of a radiation which is called Cherenkov radiation to catch those people fill the salt mines with water and with special detectors called photomultipliers in order to try and observe those neutrinos if you observe the right amount of neutrinos you can basically count how many interactions nuclear interactions are going on in the middle of the sun at each moment that's quite spectacular and that was done with one amazing result we found that only a third of the neutrinos that we expected are arriving at earth whoops so in summary the sun is held together by gravity 
and the pressure in its center holds it from collapsing upon itself. Nuclear fusion, which is the whole process discussed in this lecture, is what keeps the sun going. Remember, nuclear fusion is that process by which four hydrogen nuclei become helium. In the process, lots of e equals mc square happens. Solar neutrinos tell us that this is really what's happening. Since the late 1960s, we knew about this problem of having too few neutrinos, one-third neutrinos. That was the mystery of neutrinos. Some people even said maybe the sun stopped working. In which case, within a few thousand or a few million years, the sun would stop producing energy. Uh oh. But recently we found a reason for that which happened. And the reason is that that one type of neutrino splits into three types of neutrinos on the way to Earth. This discovery was made only three years ago. Now more on how we know that other stars are working the same exact way or similar way will be discussed in the next lecture.